Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is LJ Stanbrook. I'm the presidency of the World Affairs Council. Welcome to our program, our distinguished series, World Affairs Council Charlotte program. And today we have an old friend, someone who has been with us in Charlotte and spoken to us before, uh, Philip Cogan from The Economist of London. I would like to share with you that the World Affairs Council is a nonpartisan, non government organization. So any opinion expressed here is not ours. It is the expressed opinion of the speaker. Uh, we promote dialogue on international affairs and global issues. And we invite you, please, to participate in this conversation today by using the question and answer box in the Zoom toolbar. And you have a, a, a little uh, icon showing um, to you where the question and answer little function button is. So to submit a question at any time, please use that Q&A box in the Zoom toolbar. Your microphone will be on mute and your camera turned off for the duration of the presentation. This presentation will be recorded and sent out via email to all of you and to the World Affairs Council mailing list. So make sure you're signed up to receive our emails uh, we would appreciate that. If you enjoyed today's free program, please consider making a donation to help support, support our work and, and continuing fulfilling our mission. And we appreciate your help very, very much. Thank you for that. Philip Cogan writes the Bartleby column for The Economist, having previously written the Buttonwood column. Before that, he was a journalist at the Financial Times, Times for 20 years, writing the Longview column and originating the short view column. He has won, won a number of awards, including Senior Financial Journalist of the Year in 2008 and the CFA UK Journalist of the Year in 2016. Congratulations, Phil. The Times described him as one of the best financial journalists of his generation. He has a new book out, A, His a History of the World Economy from the Iron Age to the Information Age, which takes the reader from the trading of stone axes in the Neolithic era through to the giant container ships that bring goods around the world today. Along the way, it demonstrates how the connections that link humans have made us more prosperous, allowing us to grow taller, live longer, and have many more choices about our lives. To rephrase the famous Blanche de Beau, we are dependent on the hard work of strangers. Philip, it is all yours. Thank you very much indeed, LJ. And um, thank you everybody in Charlotte for um, sparing the time to listen to me today. I really enjoyed coming there seven years ago and um, I'm glad to be able to speak to you again. So as LJ said, um, what we don't realize often is that we are dependent on the hard work of strangers to provide us with our everyday goods. And let me just take a very simple thing that you'll find in your bathroom, a tube of toothpaste. Um, you probably never give much thought to it. And of course, other tubes of toothpaste are available apart from Colgate. But this particular one has 19 different ingredients. It has uh, zinc citrate to stop bad breath. It has hydrated silica as an abrasive to get stuff off your teeth. It has xanthan gum as a thickening agent. It has sodium fluoride to stop decay in your teeth. And all of those ingredients have to be mined or grown in different parts of the world and then transported back to the factory where they're made. Uh, so does the elements that go into the tube in which the toothpaste appears, so does the cap, so does the cardboard in which that tube goes, and so does the ink that goes onto the outside of the box. And somebody designed the logo and decided on the uh, print in it. Uh, and that's the first order of people, many, many thousands of people. And then you go to the second order. Somebody had to build the ships um, to bring the products from the rest of the world to the factory. Somebody had to build the trucks. Uh, and somebody had to create the roads and the ports uh, with, on which those trucks and ships uh, went through. And that's the second order. And then if you think back to a third order, somebody had to finance the companies uh, that did all that. Uh, and you yourselves may have 
owned equities in the companies that made the toothpaste or the ingredients of the toothpaste or the trucks that brought the toothpaste. So probably just for this one simple good, there are many millions of people in the world who have been involved in its production. And um, just as it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a planet to fill your house with goods. And we are all dependent on the hard work of strangers. We are all dependent on collaboration all the time. Um, and if you go back in history, that was rarely the case. If you go way back to the um, period BC, then there were a few goods that were globalized. Precious metals uh, and jewels were transported uh, across borders. Um, but that was only tended to be um, goods for the rich. So what changed, and I'm going to experiment with technology here. Um, can you see that? No, oh, hold on, sorry. Uh, come on, Sammy. Sorry. Sorry. Great. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, my daughter helped with the presentation. So this is the great transformation in the world economy, which appeared about um, 1800. Um, up until then, growth in GDP, it's almost impossible to see it on the line, was very, very slow. And sometimes it didn't occur at all. Somewhere about 1800, we get this famous hockey stick uh, development where world growth um, shot up. And Understanding that is really understanding why we are better off uh, than we were uh, many centuries ago. And it's a number of factors that explain it, but globalization, the linking of the different continents is one of them. So if you go back to around 1500, two big things happen. First, the Portuguese and the Vasco da Gama worked their way around Africa and muscled in on the great Asian trading networks that linked uh, India, the South Sea Islands, and uh, China. And they had better armaments, better ships, and were able to act as a kind of protection racket on that trade. And then the Portuguese in their turn were uh, overtaken by the Dutch, the French, uh, and the English, uh, and Europe uh, controlled quite a lot of that Asian trade. And secondly, of course, uh, Columbus uh, meant that Europeans discovered America, and that uh, led to the great development of the silver mines, uh, particularly in uh, Bolivia. And so for a couple of centuries, there was a kind of globalized system where the Europeans brought silver from America and exchanged it for uh, Asian goods. Because at that stage, the Asian economy were, still had lots of very sophisticated things that Europeans wanted. And then in... Uh, 17th, the 18th century or so, uh, we had another key element uh, of the uh, globalization process, which was the discovery of uh, uh, industrialization, the use of coal initially to power machinery. And that was a transformation in uh, human life. So previously, we depended almost entirely on human and animal power, a little bit of wind and water to drive our um, machines. But suddenly we had this enormous resource of the coal that had been stored um, many millions of years ago uh, as forests decayed. And a hundred years later, then we had the oil. So there are a number of explanations for why this hockey stick went up. Energy, the exploitation of energy was clearly one of them. Secondly, uh, there was a cultural change. So if you think back to the Middle Ages, um, very feudal societies. The aristocrats in charge uh, were mainly interested in social position rather than growing the economy. Oddly enough, the Black Death, which itself was a, a symptom of early globalization because it swept across with the Mongol armies in the 14th century, uh, that made a significant change. Um, and it, in, particularly in Western Europe, it freed the peasants, brought them higher wages, and started a process whereby uh, ordinary people um, had the ability to buy a few more goods. And in the 17th, 18th century, you had what's called the Industrious Revolution, where workers were very interested in buying tea and coffee uh, and uh, pots 
and um, cutlery, uh, and this made, meant, meant that they worked rather harder. In Spain, Italy in the 16th century, there were 200 holy days which uh, people would take off, uh, and they could probably afford to do it in the agricultural economy. In the artisanal uh, industrial economy, that didn't happen. People worked uh, an awful lot harder. Uh, and culturally also, we learned via the discovery of America by Europeans that um, there were more things that were known than the ancients knew. Previously, we'd sort of thought almost that everything that we needed to know uh, had already been absorbed by the Greeks and Romans. Uh, and that wasn't, uh, clearly wasn't the case. And science developed and people started to uh, investigate the natural world uh, and the world of science and try and uh, experiment with new things and that fled through into a great technological change so technology culture the discovery and of course exploitation of uh, america and its people and uh, the and of asia uh, and this huge um, energy source all came together in the 18th century uh, to create uh, this hockey stick development in uh, global growth and secondly it, it took a while, so this graph is global life expectancy. There was, in the early years in Britain in the 19th century, actually a decline in life expectancy in some of the cities that were created because the conditions were so awful. Um, there was no proper sewerage um, or proper running water, so disease spread very quickly. Uh, and the conditions in the factories were pretty grim too. But from about 1850 on, we saw a pickup in life expectancy, um, and that meant uh, and that gradually started to spread through the rest of the world in the 20th century. And as you can see, um, it took off uh, in definitely after 1950 or so. And another enormous development that uh, economic growth um, created was the ability of um, people to, to have their children survive. So often in uh, the earlier years, um, a large proportion of children, 40% uh, or so, would die in the first five years of life. And as you can see uh, again from this graph, that proportion has thankfully um, declined significantly. And again, there's been a big decline in the last 50 years as the developed world has benefited from some of the changes, sorry, the developing world has benefited from some of the changes we in the developed world have had before. And another great change is that the uh, the boon of the Industrial Revolution was largely seen in uh, Europe and America, um, as Japan as well, up to about 1950 or so. But in the post-war era, we saw the great success of the Asian Tigers, the Singapores, the Taiwans, the uh, South Koreas. And then in the last 30 years or so, we've seen a big fall in global poverty as China, India, and some of the other Asian nations and some African nations have come into the global economy uh, and have been able to benefit from economic growth. Um, so these are uh, enormous um, changes in the global economy uh, that have um, been uh, very beneficial to people in the last uh, 300 years. And I the benefits of that are not just confined to um, the way that we traded goods. The 19th century was also an, an enormous part uh, of uh, global migration. So the peopling of America in the 19th century, which went on from 1820 to 1914 uh, in huge numbers, um, created, of course, the great economy that you have, the great nation that you have now. But it also allowed many of the people from America who had been stuck in very poor agricultural economies and sometimes um, persecuted for their religion uh, or their politics, allowed them to escape the European uh, feudal states and uh, like Austria-Hungary, Russia, and come uh, to America. So that global migration was almost a sort of fantastic um, improvement in efficiency of the global economy as we moved from places where we had too much, too many people and not enough land to America where you had plenty of land but not enough people. Uh, and that helped of course grow the global economy um, in the late 19th century and then the 
opening up via the transport revolution of the 19th century, the railways and steamships um, allowed the meat of South America, the wheat of North America to come over uh, to Europe. And Europe then, uh, that freed the population of Europe from working in agriculture and allowed the European labor force to move into industry. So this was an enormously uh, beneficial feedback process of one global system working together. Uh, I'm going to try back without my daughter now to go back to the uh, to slides here. Go on. Yes. Um, I just want to show you one more graph. So there were two great er eras of globalization. So um, that first one you can see going up to 1914. Um, which was the, the, the great one of America opening up and the rest of the world uh, shipping its people and its goods to it. And then we see a great dip. This is world trade as a proportion of GDP between 1914 and 1945. And that period when globalization went into reverse is a period we remember as being a very bad period uh, for the world economy and for the world in general. We had two world wars. We had uh, the Great Depression of the 1930s. And we had immigration um, cut down around the world. So there was a, an act in 1991 in America to stop immigration that wasn't repealed until 1965. So suddenly the <coughs> greater efficiency that was possible when we had people connecting, um, that stopped happening. And it was, wasn't until about 1970 that we saw uh, global trade catch up again as a proportion of GDP. Um, and then we can see as the graph takes off in the last 40 years of the uh, or so that we uh, got the great declines in poverty and the uh, increases in life expectancy in the developing world that I showed in the earlier graphs. So um, why, is, um, why is there something to worry about now? I think the uh, reason to worry now is that we're seeing some of the same um, trends that we saw between 1914 and 1945. Before 1914, Britain ruled the waves, literally and figuratively, uh, in that the British Navy um, guaranteed global trade uh, and the British uh, financial system uh, backed up the global economy. Um, but Britain's uh, power by 1914 had been overtaken, obviously, by America and caught up with uh, by Germany, and the World War finished off British leadership in this respect. Between the two world wars, uh, America retreated from a world leadership uh, and we had that difficult period, obviously the Soviet Union emerged, creating a rival power base and uh, the interwar period was torn as Germany uh, re-established re its power and uh, tried to right what it saw as the wrongs of the First World War. And then after the Second World War, America reorganized the world's institutions, organized free trade within its bloc, for 30 years, you had what they called in Germany the Wirtschaftswunder, the great period of expansion. Uh, and then later on, as other nations retreated from communism, realized their mistake and joined in the world trading system, we saw the end of that graph where world trade shot up again. Uh, and that was a tremendously um, uh, expansionary process for globalization. And obviously, some people felt it had its downsides in terms of the wages of uh, manufacturing workers and the employment opportunities for manufacturing workers in the West. And that's why we've seen a political reaction since then. But if we enter a period uh, again now where no longer is the US the sole superpower, China is a rival superpower, uh, we have tensions between the countries, then we have the risk of going back towards that 1914-1945 period uh, when we start to erect barriers between trade. And the reason connection's so good is because it makes sense that the more people you have connected, the more good ideas can uh, be created and can be exchanged, and the greater efficiencies we can create in the economy, the more we can produce with less. Even in the midst of this global pandemic, which might seem to illustrate the dangers of, of, of globalization, you see people from all over the world trying to come up with vaccines with medicines and sharing their scientific uh, evidence between each other and doing it virtually instantly thanks to the internet. Uh, so 
there is the great scope for globalization, I think, uh, to still benefit mankind. And it's a danger if we start retreating from it, as I suppose at the World Affairs Council, uh, you would understand. Um, now, I just want to also mention that, that some people take a quite different view uh, about e economics and say that um, GDP is not important, um, that it's, uh, we concentrate too much of it at the extent of, uh, at the expense of everything else. And there's a great Bobby Kennedy a speech, which you can look up afterwards, where he says, you know, GDP doesn't capture the, uh, the joy over the birth of a child or the beauty of the forest or whatever. That, and that, all of that is true. But I just want to take you back to the period before um, globalization, the great expansion, the hockey stick that I showed you earlier. And imagine that you were born not in 1970 or whatever, but in, say, 1420. Um, so if you were, as I mentioned, your initial battle was to survive the first year or two of life. And infant mortality was around 30% back then. Um, if you were, you would probably have been a peasant and because that was 90% of the population. So you'd have had very little in the way of furniture. You might have had the odd stool to sit on, but there's no armchairs. You'd have slept on a straw bed, um, probably infested with fleas and lice. You'd have had no privacy whatsoever. Everybody would sleep together to be near to the fire, which is the only source of warmth. You'd have no cutlery to eat your food with, and very little light at night. Uh, candles, extremely expensive, and they were the main source of light. The food choice was extremely limited. There was no refrigeration to keep it from, from uh, spoiling. So if you lived in China, you'd have millet, wheat, rice, and that supplied four-fifths of all the energy that Chinese people got. Europeans survived on, on coarse bread uh, and vegetables made into stews. Meat and fish were the occasional treat, if you could get it. And the poor nutrition meant that people were smaller than they are today. There was no running water. There were no flushing toilets. Any water in the house had to be carried in, normally by the women of the family from the village well or from a river. In terms of entertainment, there was, of course, no TV, no radio, and no printed books. If you could read in the first place, and if, even if you could read, there were very few eyeglasses. So, like me, you're getting a bit old and you need the eyeglasses, then you probably couldn't read any more. Uh, people rarely washed and had very few changes of clothes, and, and medicine and dentistry were primitive. So woe betide you if you happened to get ill. Women had to have several children to ensure that one or two made it to adulthood, and one in three died in, pregnant, in uh, childbirth. So that was, pregnancy was a high-stakes gamble. Life expectancy overall was under 30, as opposed to 80 or so in the developed world today. If your house was robbed or attacked, there was no police service to protect you, and if it, the wood or straw in your house caught fire, there was no fire brigade. If you were male, you'd spend most of your life working on your own patch of land, or when they demanded it, the patch of land of your social superiors. You'd need permission to get married from your local lord. If you're a female, you might be employed as a servant until you're old enough to get married. You do the bulk of the housework. You'd also be expected to uh, raise crops. Uh, and earn money by sewing or spinning. That's why we get the term spinster for single females. And most people would spend their entire lives within a few year, a few miles of where they lived. Uh, roads were rudimentary. There were no railways or planes or cars, of course. Um, and maybe there was a better sense of community than there were modern societies, but there was much less choice um, than there was before. So. Thanks to economics, thanks to this great process of connecting, trading with our fellow citizens from around the world. More children survive to adulthood. They grow up to be taller, better educated, and have much more choice uh, over how they live their lives than they did in, in medieval times. They have a far greater chance of dying peacefully in their beds of old age. So all of these advances wouldn't have been possible without the benefits of economic growth. So, yes, economics isn't everything, but the history of mankind, the history of the last uh, three or four hundred years, is that when economies work together, they can produce enormous benefits for people. Uh, and they have, the reason I'm able to talk to you via, uh, from my own living room in West London uh, to Charlotte, is thanks to technology, which has only been developed over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. And um, the fact that you can all get 
enormous information in your smartphone that would have been was the equivalent of computing power that was bigger than was uh, on the entire Apollo 11 a spaceship just shows that even though sometimes it seems that we're struggling we are still advancing and we can still advance uh, if we connect with each other and I know the World Affairs Council is devoted to that um, so I would commend to you a belief that we can still uh, by connecting with each other uh, make our lives better thanks very much and I'm happy to take questions now thank you so very much Philip and, and, and thank you for leading us through uh, um, the history of the modern, modern e economy, how we got here and how it's the interaction between people that, that brings us uh, uh, um, to, to this step point where we are more trade, more specialization, more freedom and ultimately uh, more prosperity. I would like to use this opportunity to uh, welcome and greet uh, uh, my good friend Bill, the President and CEO of the World Affairs Councils of America and also to promote the CNC project where all the councils across the country this week are having numerous programs that they're sharing. I recommend to everyone to please go to the World Affairs Councils of America website or to our Wednesday newsletter to see all the programs that are uh, coming up today and um, also tomorrow. So Bill Clifford, thank you for being here. And let me start with the questions and, and we try to keep the moderator here uh, to a minimum so we get a maximum out of Philip Cogan. But let me start and ask you, your family, you, where are you now? How are you coping with COVID-19 pandemic? Can you tell a little bit more about uh, what's happening in your life right now? So uh, I'm in West London. The, I work for The Economist and it's been um, seven weeks since I was last in the office. Um, we've been working from home for all that time. Um, and my wife works for the BBC. She's busy trying to make a programme um, at the moment uh, for, the, for the World Series, for the World Service. And my kids um, have been quite disrupted. Their lives have been disrupted. So my daughter was doing her final um, high school exams or scheduled to do the final high school exams to get to university. Uh, this summer and those have been cancelled. My other daughter's already at college. She was supposed to do her final exams um, also this year and they've been cancelled. So we're all in together in the house. We are allowed to go out, um, but there is not much to go out for. Um, restaurants, uh, coffee shops, pubs are all closed. Uh, most shops are closed. Um, it's basically a matter of going to the supermarket to get, to get the groceries. Uh, and um, there is much to my sadness and I think yours LJ um, no sport to watch either so it wouldn't be so bad if we were stuck here on our own if there was sport to watch all the time but we haven't even got that but we're we are sadly the second most deaths in the world after America from the uh, pandemic so we've had our own problems with policy um, but they're expected to start to ease up um, some of the restrictions from um, Sunday night Thank you so very much, Philip. So we'll start now with the question and answers. We already have um, some questions posted. Please feel free to put your questions up as soon as possible. And I'll turn it over to Jesse Herman. Jesse. Hello, so thank you for that presentation, Philip. And thank you to all of the attendees that were able to participate today. We're delighted to have you here. As we've mentioned, feel free to go ahead and submit your questions in that Q&A box. My name is Jesse Herman. I am the Director of Programs here at the World Affairs Council of Charlotte. I will be reading off the questions and then turning the presentation back over to Philip. So let's get started today with a theory question. In T.M. Scanlon's philosophical book, On What We Owe Each Other, he explains that since there is no guarantee of moral desert when we die, the only reason we should be good people is because it's what we owe to each other. How would you relate Scanlon's idea to yours on the work of strangers? Gosh, what a profound question. Um, <laughs> I was expecting something more on economics. Well, I think um, Adam Smith was very good on this, that we, we don't uh, rely on the beneficence of uh, the butcher, the baker, um, but slight, on their self-interest. but we people are social animals and we depend on each other uh for everything so i'm a journalist um as you probably might have seen my daughter uh, helped me with the technology uh, it, you know if it was entirely up to me you know you'd i probably had to send this speech over by pigeon to you um in charlotte so uh we all have skills and the beauty of um codependence is that we can do what we are best at and rely on others to supply uh, what we're not good at. 
And uh, that's again what I'm trying to say with the connections point, that the more of those others you can connect with, uh, the more scope, the, the better off everybody is likely to be. So one analysis might be to just to look at a, a football team or baseball team. Um, if you just have a team based on one small village, you might have one really big guy in if you can um, be the linebacker or uh, the uh, big hitter. Uh, and you might have a few others who are reasonable. But the chances are, if you're picking from such a small uh, group, you won't have the talent that somebody in a, a small town would have, and similarly, not somebody in a big city. And if you go to the world as a whole, you can pick in uh, pick um, the best players in the world. So uh, baseball uh, depends on lots of players from uh, Latin American nations, J Japan, for example, uh, in my country, Premier League football, we have players from Argentina, Russia, Spain, Italy, uh, who supplement the uh, British players. And that's why the league is so good. So it's the uh, finding of those best talents that makes everybody better off. And yes, uh, sometimes um, that's done altruistically. Um, so after this talk, uh, I will be going outside at eight o'clock precisely to clap uh, for the National Health Service, uh, which uh, everybody does at eight o'clock on Thursday night in this country in the course of the pandemic. Uh, and one of my neighbours, who was a um, private dermatologist, has gone into the intensive care units to try and help out over the last few weeks. I should be clapping for him. So sometimes people do connect for altruistic reasons and sometimes they do connect for uh, economic reasons, but it's those connections, without those connections, uh, we would struggle. And there's a story in my book about a guy who tried to make a toaster from scratch, tried to assemble all the raw materials. It took him five years. Uh, and when it, he put, turned it on, it lasted about 10 seconds before it, it burnt out. We, we couldn't possibly do everything that we, uh, get, create everything that we need by ourselves. We depend on others. All right, so a question from Peter Gisela. In your book, Paper Promises, you mentioned that new systems will emerge. So in May 2020, during this COVID-19 economic crisis, what new systems will emerge for hardworking strangers? Yes, that's, that's a good question. Now, I, I confess, I expected um, the debt to lead to a rearrangement of the global currency system. That's one of the things that book argued. And that hasn't happened, I admit to that. Um, and the reason it hasn't happened is that we changed in a quite different way. We moved to a world which I don't think anybody would have expected um, 15 years ago and not even 10 years ago, where we have virtually zero interest rates uh, around the globe. Uh, and uh, the central banks of the world in this crisis buying up not just government bonds, but now corporate bonds. So we have a, an extraordinary system where the whole thing is kept afloat uh, by the creation of, of new money um, to keep us going. And, that, and that's something that the authorities have been more successful in pulling off than I would have expected 10 years ago. But we are now seeing uh, new systems emerge. And I think the worrying thing is we might get um, the emergence of three different trading systems. So the tensions between America and China might lead to countries being forced to choose between the two countries. So you've seen um, China punish uh, uh, tried to punish, for example, Australia for calling for an independent inquiry into the virus. You see in America punish uh, people who uh, cooperated with Chinese companies. Uh, and then you've got the European Union as a third block in the middle. And this is quite similar to the dangerous period we had before 1914, where you had the world uh, emerge into those uh, big power blocks, um, Britain, France, Russia, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and then, of course, America uh, on the side there. Uh, and the danger then is this leads to the siloing of the world uh, rather than the cooperation of the world. And I'm not sure how we're going to get out of that because um, the effect of uh, the last 20 or 30 years of very poor wage growth um, for people in uh, many Western countries means there is a sort of hostility towards globalization, uh, which is understandable, um, uh, but means that nationalism uh, is very appealing. And it was nationalism, of course, that was the big problem in the 1914 to 45 period. So uh, I'm a bit worried that the changes in the system now will not be good. A question from Sandra Dolliter. 
Can you talk about child labor and forced and bonded labor that are still prevalent in supply chains of many major brands? Yes, uh, that is terrible. And of course, we should mention, I do mention in the book, um, the role of slavery in the um, Industrial Revolution and the, um, it's important not to forget that, uh, it was only uh, abolished in the, in the 19th century. Uh, and it's significant that the Britain, when Britain abolished slavery, they compensated the owners, but not the slaves, which is a uh, rather terrible indictment. But yes, you're right. There are still areas of the global economy where uh, child labor is used. Um, the people in those countries, of course, would say, uh, and there is some point to this, that child labor was always used in the agricultural sector uh, and putting their children out to work in, in factories uh, actually makes the family better off. And this happened in Britain, this happened in America in the 19th century. Um, and so this is a, a process that countries go through before they eventually get prosperous enough not to need child labor anymore. Uh, but bonded labor is significant. So that happens in China, as we know. Uh, it happens in uh, some other uh, um, countries. Uh, and um, the only thing that can be done about this is to put pressure on consumer brands to stop it. And that does happen. Uh, one of the other things I write about in the Bartleby column is is um, this idea of uh, consumers putting pressure, it's often called woke capitalism, but there are other names for it, uh, on companies to change. And the companies are extremely conscious. They do not want bad publicity. They do not want consumers to boycott their brands and they are sensitive. And if you talk to corporate leaders, which we do, uh, then you'll find they are concerned about these issues. And the last thing they want is some social media storm um, that when they find out that a uh, factory is using child labor or a bonded labor in the in the particular country sometimes you know they genuinely don't know and they're horrified to find out so it's a role that consumers can play uh, and indeed a free press can play to spot these things highlight them and force companies to change professor victor chen at the university of north carolina at charlotte is interested in your thoughts on the future of global money in the post covid 19 world what would be the world's financial system on the other on international currencies? Would the US dollar be weaker or stronger? Related, how is China's Belt Road Initiative changing this equilibrium? Yes, good question again. Um, the, so far in COVID, the dollar has strengthened uh, rather than weakened. Uh, and it's, it's remarkable that also happened in 2008, 2009. Uh, Nuro Rabini, some of you may have heard of Dr. Doom, uh, got some credit for predicting a crisis but he thought the dollar would crash in those circumstances that's that's not what happened it seems that when there's trouble in the world people tend to flock to the greater liquidity of u.s assets and whilst the chinese economy has grown very fast <coughs> excuse me the financial system has not uh, grown to the same extent that uh, it's easy for people to invest in uh, chinese assets and i don't think international investors yet have the confidence to be certain that the chinese government would look after their assets in the way that they are confident about the american government uh, doing so. Um, so I think the change in the global system towards and some multipolar uh, currencies are, is, go is still going to be slow. So Britain lost its world power after 1914, but there was a sterling currency area used in parts of the world well into the 1950s. Um, so these things don't um, change overnight, they can take time. Um, second, on the global currency system, I think the interesting thing is uh, will we have um, digital currencies will central banks um, decide to produce uh, digital currencies the, the central banking version of bitcoin uh, to use and i think it, i think it's possible um, they have they have been looking into it i know the bank of england has uh, looked into this uh, and there are some attractions of it now the the great um, schism here is that people like bitcoin because of its anonymity and uh, central banks hate Bitcoin because of its anonymity. Um, so then we'll have a battle really between a, uh, possibly between two sorts of digital currencies. One which the authorities want to promote uh, because it means they can track what everybody's doing. And another one that of course the authorities are not so keen on. And I don't know how things, how trade is being conducted in the States at the moment, but in Britain, nobody wants cash because nobody wants you to hand over uh, notes which you've, you've touched, they'd much rather you use the contactless uh, credit card or debit card. So cash may have been given a further kicking by this and we may be moving further away from the cashless area and that opens up the scope uh, for digital money of one form or another to be more important over the coming decades. 
All right, we've got a conceptual question from Bill Clifford, which is what kind of economy should we reopen? One that goes back to market-driven globalization where the outcome has been stagnant medium wages for decades, or can we move to a new economy where everyone has access to healthcare, not just in a pandemic, where paid sick leave is the norm so they don't have to go back to a meat packing plant and risk disease, and where essential workers are respected, not just in times of a pandemic? Well, I'd agree with all that. It's not necessarily um, antithetical to having markets, uh, I'd say. So in um, plain parts of Europe, we have uh, plenty of markets and we have um, public health systems. As I was mentioning, I'm going off to clap for the NHS after this. Um, so anybody who's taken ill here doesn't have to worry about the bills that would follow from it. Um, we have... Um, social benefits uh, that um, mean that uh, workers are kept out of absolute poverty. Britain's sick pay regime is not very good, but uh, France, Germany, uh, uh, they have much better uh, sick pay systems and much higher proportion of earnings is paid out. Uh, and I think um, the role of key workers um, is being recognised in this system uh, and ought, ought to lead to higher pay in the medium term. What uh, is happening, I think, uh, we need to think about is that the ageing of um, the world uh, population, of the developed world population, means that uh, we will be all dependent on uh, social care in our old age, or a lot more of us will be. Uh, and that will mean that um, there will be great demand for uh, social care workers to look after us in, in retirement homes. Um, now, the last um, couple of years has seen a decline in immigration. Uh, and if you, my mother, who was in a nursing home until quite recently, uh, the people who looked after were nearly all from overseas. Uh, and if they need to attract um, people to look after the elderly in future years, they will just simply have to pay higher wages. So one, just to go back to the sort of philosophical point of the question, I think it's a mistake to say that there is um, you know, a complete uh, black and white world between completely free markets and um, state control. Most countries in the OECD, the rich club nations, have governments that spend about 30 to 50 percent of GDP. And we're really all arguing about where the line should be drawn. And in America, it's drawn um, more towards the free market end of the spectrum. In France um, and Germany, uh, more towards the state controlled area of the system and Britain were roughly in the middle. But you know, if you showed this economy to somebody 100 years ago or 80 years ago, uh, they'd be amazed at how big a role government plays. And I think um, it's foolish to think that um, the private sector uh, can get along without the government. You need the government to provide security, you need the government to provide courts, you need the government to provide roads, you need the government to educate the workers who work in the factories. And similarly, the uh, government depends on the private sector to generate the wealth that uh, gets the taxes to pay for uh, government services. So I really hope we get away in the next decade or so from this idea that, you know, it's, it's all free markets or all the government. Uh, it's not. It's, it's a balance between the two. And it's, it's just about where we change things at the margin. Uh, the two elements depend on each other. A question from Frederick Grisset. Do you anticipate any adaptation to Brexit as a result of the current pandemic? Well, uh, I would only hope so. Um, <laughs> the Economist uh, was uh, argued for Remain. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I was a European skeptic about some of the elements of the EU, but the arguments that were produced in the referendum campaign was so uh, dreadful that um, it was impossible <laughs> not to react against the Leave side. And it, we've had that since then. So at the moment, we are, connect, we are committed to leaving completely at the end of this year, uh, regardless of whether we have a deal. The idea that after the economic damage created by the pandemic, which the Bank of England suggested might cause GDP to fall by 30% in the current quarter, and for this to be the worst year in the British economy since 1706 this year. The idea at the end of that year, you would suddenly say, oh, well, you know, uh, we can disrupt all our trading links with our major uh, customer for our exports. It just seems completely mad. There is an ideological uh, thing about this that uh, people in the Conservative Party, you know, want to act tough and think the EU will give in. But I'm hoping that by the end of the year, uh, we will see sense and that we will come to some deal whereby uh, the majority 
of uh, goods and services flow um, uninterrupted and that we do sign up to some of the rules and regulations that the EU um, imposes on uh, member nations uh, uh, because you know after all there are plenty of EU rules and regulations uh, that are good for me the the British beaches were um, swamped with sewage uh, 30 40 years ago and EU rules stop that happening EU rules stops um, mobile phone operators from charging uh, roaming charges every time I go to Europe uh, that was abolished. So you know, the idea that all rules is back to this thing about government and private sector. The idea that all rules are foolish and restrictive, that's not the case. Sometimes rules can be good for consumers uh, and uh, accommodating with our neighbours is only sensible. A question from Chase Saunders. Regarding the theory of comparative advantage, where everybody trades things they are good at and most things work out well, how does that stand up to China having the population and platform to do everything with value? leaving everyone else to provide food or recreation as colonials? Um, well, I'd throw that back and say, how did that work out um, for America, which could do everything of value um, in post-1900? Um, so America suddenly emerged um, like a giant looming over Europe in the late 19th century as the population grew. And American um, meat and wheat, dominated European markets. American manufactured goods uh, were better than uh, European manufactured goods. American financial power emerged. But, uh, and British relative power declined um, tremendously. But am I better off than my great grandfather? Uh, if you go back to 1914, yes, of course. So my great, uh, sorry, my great aunt, Auntie Amy, uh, she was still in the 60s. She was living in a one up, one down house. Uh, the, in a cobbled street, one up, one down means you have one room on the on the ground floor, one room on the uh, next floor, and that's the bedroom, uh, and the sink came down, you folded a cupboard. The, the toilet was outside, so at two o'clock in the morning, if she's when she was 80, she had to go outside whatever the weather. So we have made, in all, people don't live in houses like that, so despite our relative decline, we have um, prospered in Britain, and that's true of the rest of Europe. Uh, lots of France didn't have indoor plumbing until the 1950s. Um, so um, China uh, does uh, break the rules, does steal secrets, uh, as did America in the 19th century for Britain, funnily enough. Um, but uh, in the long run, uh, if China, China has its own problems, it will, uh, its uh, population is aging very fast, for, thanks to the one-child policy, a very draconian one-child policy uh, after the 1970s. Uh, and it's worried about India emerging um, to uh, threaten it as a, a global superpower. Um, so provided that we don't have war and complete uh, trade isolation, then other countries getting rich in the end makes us rich. And America's great um, relative and comparative advantage in goods didn't stop Europe getting more prosperous in the 20th century and China won't stop us continuing to get more prosperous in the 21st century. Could the enormous rise in personal benefits from globalization have made some populations, like the United States, take for granted their comfortable lives and no longer see the need for learning history and assume that making money is all that is needed to maintain the status quo? Uh, yes, that's, that's, that's a bit, slightly more the statement than a question, but um, yeah, I, yes, I've obviously, um, history, I believe in history, I've just written a book of history, um, and I think it is very important to, to learn it. And I think it's very important to learn um, about um, economic history as well, because I think people don't reflect that point that I was trying to make at the start, that almost everything we use uh, has been produced through the hard work of strangers through the collaboration of others. Um, and um, America is a nation uh, of immigrants, uh, people who've come in from all over the world and believed in the American dream and been right to believe in the American dream and created you know most powerful prosperous nation on earth um, and uh, it's worth reflecting on on that history when you look back and think that uh, america prospered from um that uh, opening uh, up in the late 19th century uh, to people and it can uh, prosper again uh, and it, if you i think i can't remember the exact statistic on what proportion of um, s p 500 companies were founded by immigrant entrepreneurs but it's, it's a quite a high proportion of them uh, and the uh, technology many of the technology advances have been produced with the help of uh, engineers from uh, asia and other parts of the world um, 
so yes I, of course it's worth it's not all about um spending money of course it's not but uh, many of the advances that we've had in uh, public health have only been possible because of uh, economic developments if you think uh, i recently had a health scare and i had a, a ct scan and as you go through the ct scan you think you know how fantastic it is that this uh, machine can uh, look inside you in you know a matter of a couple of minutes uh, to check on you which is something you know they would probably been out at me with a, a chainsaw about uh, 50 years ago um, so technology brings benefits not just in terms of money but it brings benefits uh, to us in terms of our uh, health and uh, emotional well-being and you know if you think in this crisis which is showing of course you know uh, some of the dangers of, of, um, of globalization because of the way the virus spread we're still able to connect with each other via zoom and other things and other technological developments uh, which means you know, I was talking to my uh, widowed sister 77 years old um, and I do that uh, regularly uh, so, and it's possible again thanks to technology 100 years ago I'd have had to send a letter which would have taken you know, two or three days to get there Looking through the lens of this pandemic, Don Upton would be interested in learning your insights on how public health outcomes may be a bigger factor in decisions to locate operations, headquarters, manufacturing, and create jobs in different regions of the world. Will the competitive scorecard of a region now require proof of dedicated, proven commitments to health outcomes in healthy communities? I think that's a really interesting point. Um, I don't know the answer to it. I suspect, yes, of course, if you think about companies citing their um, factories and their offices around the world they don't want to send their employees um, obviously often very high skilled employees to somewhere where they fear they'll get sick and one of the things that stops um, companies moving to China is the very high level of air pollution in, in that country which makes it unpleasant for some people to live in those big cities uh, and poor health systems are another factor which will stop people moving. I, there's some interesting stuff I think I've been writing about this recently what's going to happen to the way we work. So um, will we all pile into offices and sit a few feet from each other in those sort of open plan offices? The, the office, uh, uh, like the factory, is a relatively modern invention. If you go back 300 years, we mostly worked on our own or in very small uh, working groups on the farm or, you know, if you're the blacksmith or the uh, cobbler or whatever. Uh, it's only quite recently we've all piled together. And maybe we haven't adjusted to the fact that we don't need to pile together you know many of us have worked from home over the last uh, couple of months and we've realized that it's possible to do quite a lot of what we would normally do uh, and the other factor about this is uh, if you don't have to pile into a big central office you don't have to pay you know manhattan um real estate prices or um uh, dallas real estate prices or whatever you can move to other centers of the country charlotte or you know the suburbs of those um states um where the real estate is a lot cheaper and you may have a sort of little hub that you go to that's you know within 20 miles of where you live and then you join uh, you you go there for the few key meetings we have to be in there in person and for the rest of uh, time you're uh, working on your own um, at home so it may well be that uh, the pandemic does change the our attitudes to work um, uh, but the question that is back to the connections do we make better connections because we're just ha randomly bumping into people in the office and they give us an idea uh, which doesn't then happen over zoom where it's a it's obviously a much more um, compartmentalized way of communication and our last question for the day we see the nationalistic voices and policies developing quickly everywhere in the name of the common good but will these common good policies continue even after the coronavirus what do you think will happen to the ex-communist countries moving forward? They have been more efficient in imposing the new lockdown rules due to culture, but will that continue? Yes, yeah, so China, you know, there are obviously some doubts about the statistics, but certainly it's a very uh, collectivist uh, society where people uh, obey rules and are forced to obey rules. And um, you know, if you're going to have a lockdown, I think most of us in January were thinking, oh, they're locking everything down. We'll never do that here. But of course, then we did. Um, and South Korea, uh, not an, an ex-communist country, but uh, has quite successfully tackled its pandemic. Singapore, um, quite a well state controlled company uh, country, uh, similarly uh, has been good at uh, controlling in, in the non-immigrant um, worker section of the population. Um, I, I think we will be worried about pandemics for a few years to come. It's very hard to tell how long these things last. 
but um, this virus, um, to the extent we have stopped everybody from getting it, means that it's still around for the, for the rest of us to get it in the next um, two or three years. So, so all that will emerge. And it's, it's possible. We've had SARS, we've had MERS over the last 20 years. Uh, we could have, you know, H1N1 type bird flu emerge again. It's possible these things will spread more regularly than we were used to in, say, the, the late 20th century. Um, and so then I think um, uh, public health, um, the way we look at interactions on a you know, personal basis uh, will change. And those countries um, who have experienced this and experienced the immense economic damage uh, that they've suffered in the last few years, they will think about how to do it in future. We can't say we aren't warned. Uh, and just as we reacted to 9-11 by much greater security on planes, um, then we will react to this pandemic with changes in public policy pretty much globally. Thank you so much, Philip. This is, this is amazing. We enjoyed talking to our organization seven years ago. We learned so much then. We learned even more today. The way you articulate issues, make them understandable. Uh, I really enjoyed. Uh, I, I will have to share with you that one of our uh, uh, viewers participants said that uh, this is not a question. He says this is just a statement. He participated in 10 programs already this week, and this is the absolutely best program, and he is uh, very grateful for you, oh, Sherry. Thank you very much. With us and, and your time. Um, I would also like to use this opportunity to mention that your book is available on Amazon, and we put it in our chat function here. There you go, and, and I recommend it to everyone. Would like to uh, uh, welcome Megan Tory uh, as, as one of the attendees. She's the president and CEO of the Connecticut World Affairs Council and the idea of the CNC project uh, again, bringing together all the World Affairs Councils uh, for this week and sharing their programs nationally uh, was such a great idea. So, Philip, it's not only people from Charlotte, North Carolina, and the region that are, are following you here today, but also uh, uh, people across the country. We will have a video recording of this event available in, uh, for you all tomorrow. We will share uh, uh, across the region, but I encourage everyone who is here today with us uh, talking and listening to, to Philip to please share this extraordinary program uh, with as many people that you think might, might, might be interested. Um, all I can say, uh, we wish to see you here in Charlotte soon. We wish that this new normal becomes more of a normal and that people start traveling and that the uh, pandemic um, uh, comes to a, a close to an end and hopefully there won't be a, a second wind in it and that you will be able to join us uh, again in, in Charlotte and many other World Affairs Councils around the country. Thank you very much to everyone for participating. Thank you, Philip. All the very best to you and your family. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.